Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. Okay. So a few announcements. Uh, the, so these are announcements. announcements. So the final exam is going to be on Thursday. It's not two days from now. Nine days from now. Thursday. August 10th. Uh, that's going to be during lecture. Attendance is, is almost as good as it ever gets on the final exam. Two. The mandatory part of the final exam covers written homeworks, written homeworks, sixty seven to the end. So whatever, whatever, whatever further written homeworks we get to. Okay, that part will be uh, eight questions. About eight questions. So you'll, in, in preparation for the final exam, for the mandatory part, um, you'll, you will of course try all of the written homeworks and then uh, there will be PDFs uh, and videos of the keys for all of the written homeworks. <coughs> I'm going to select around eight exercises which are similar to those 67 to the end. That will constitute the mandatory part of the final exam. It'll be just like a long quiz. Okay. Um, also concerning written homeworks is that we're going to go over new things today and we're going to go over new things on Thursday. Uh, the last topic that we're going to cover in class on Thursday is annuities, which is a mathematical topic about money. <coughs> That'll be the last topic that's on the final exam. I'm going to give you written homeworks over today's material, the new stuff we do today, and also the things that we're going to do on Thursday. And I'm going to give all those to you tonight or tomorrow morning. And they're all going to be due on Tuesday. So the last time you're going to turn in any written homeworks is Tuesday the 8th. So you're not going to turn any in on Thursday. That's when we're having the final exam. That, that Tuesday, the 8th, will be review. Okay, we'll be reviewing. I'll be glad to answer any questions uh, that you have at that time. Besides studying written homework 67 to the end for the mandatory por portion, another very important aspect is going to be that the optional portion So the optional slash redo part of the final exam, you're going to select up to eight exercises from quizzes, quizzes 
1 through 15. There's 28 options. The reason why there's 28 is because that's actually 14 quizzes. Uh, because quiz 9 doesn't exist. Remember, because we had the closing. The university was closed because of that bomb threat. So quiz 9 doesn't exist. That's actually 14 quizzes. Each quiz has three exercises, but only two of them are graded. So 14 times 2 is 28. Okay, so then there's 28, uh, 28 exercises. You're allowed to select up to eight of them for redo. So uh, as for quiz strategy, uh, that is test taking strategy, for the optional part, you need to look in the gradebook and see, more or less, which are the eight exercises that I did poorest on. Okay, either because you just didn't even take the quiz, some people miss quizzes for various reasons, in which case you would have gotten a zero, or um, <clears throat> you just didn't do very well on that exercise. So in such a case, you need to, you need to look at those, those quiz exercises. You need to look at the keys, both the PDF and the video, and become very familiar with them. Okay, and you need to have some alternates, right? Don't just study eight questions. You should probably study like at least ten. Because you may really, it, you may really be convinced, okay, quiz seven, question one, that it would be really great if I could re redo that one. And then you come in here and you look at quiz seven question one and you look at that you look at it and say I have no idea how to do this that's when you need to switch to an alternate okay so does everybody get the idea so the way it's going to be is that on these two tables there's going to be a pickup tower of quiz questions and a turn in tower it's just going to be a whole bunch of them they'll be labeled individually this slot is quiz one question one this slot is quiz one, question three. This slot is quiz nine, question two, etc. Okay, so any question about the way that will go? Yeah? Yes. Yeah, they'll be quite similar. It won't be the same question, but it could be it could be as similar as I, it's the same question, but I just changed the numbers up. But at any rate, the questions will be similar enough to where I I can, as an instructor, compare these two and say, yeah, that these it makes sense to compare. This was the first time they did it. This was the second time they did it. They'll be quite similar. You know, if one of the questions had apples, then the new version might have oranges or something. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So, what that, what this means, because I, I keep getting this question, but I'll, I'll answer it. Um, that means that there's going to be about 36 quiz questions when, the, when time is over. That is to say, there's, there's 28 that you will have taken on quizzes 1 through 15. And then there's going to be 8 more. So there's going to, that 28 plus 8 is 36. These 36 quiz exercises constitute 70% of your grade in the class. Okay, so that means that every quiz exercise counts for about 2 points. Okay. Any question about that? So it so you really can swing your grade a great deal on the final because there's there's eight or so so new questions and then there's eight or so questions that you can redo. So if you got zeros on those eight that you're going to redo, you could literally swing just as a result of the redo. You could literally change your course grade by 16 points. Okay, so you, you really can make a big effect. 
Okay. And just to remind you, the, the, the reason for this, for this policy is I don't really care whether or not you n knew uh, integration by parts, say, back on quiz seven or whatever when we did it. I mean, I wish you would have known it then, but all that I really need you to know, all I really need from you is for you to know it by the time you leave. Okay? So any question about the way the final exam will go? Any, any grade book matters? Yeah? No. So, so uh, for the online homeworks, uh, we're dropping the lowest two. So there's about 20, and we're dropping the lowest two, so I'm dropping essentially the lowest 10% of your online homeworks. Then there's going to be about 80 written homeworks. About 20 of them were graded by hand out of 10, and the rest were just checked for completion, and they're out of one. So of the 20 graded written homeworks, I dropped the lowest two. And of the 60 completion written homeworks, I dropped the lowest six. So that's 10% from each category. For the quizzes, we're not dropping any because you have your chance to redo them. So that means you're, you're getting a chance to redo eight out of 36. So that's 22%. You're allowed, to, you're allowed to redo up to 22% 20, of your quiz grade during the final exam. So lots, lots of chances. Other questions? So like, if I only have like, three pathway on um, my quizzes, so I only have to pick three of them. Right. You're, you're free to pick. Uh, for, for the op it's, it's optional. You could, you could do the... I mean, everything's optional in a certain sense, right? <laughs> but you don't have to do eight. You can just select three or just one. But don't select more because you'll be penalized for doing that. Because in, in the end, there's, there's just, I only have so much labor that I can allocate to the task of grading. Right? I would love it if all of you could could have the time and the opportunity to redo every single one, that'd be terrific, but I just, I don't have that much labor at my disposal. Other questions? I'm sorry? Well, it's, there's eight new quiz exercises on the final exam. And what it, that means that there's 36 total quiz exercises. Those 36 count 70% of your grade. Written homework is 15, online homework is 15. So it doesn't really make sense to ask how much does, I, I don't think it makes any direct sense to ask how much the, the final exam counts. It's that it, it adds eight more quiz exercises and you're allowed to redo eight more. And then those, the 36 total quiz exercises count 70%. I guess you could think of it like if you just decided to just sit out the final exam and take zeros, do no redos and take zeros on all the new questions, that would knock you down by about 15 points. So you could think of it like that. Other questions? Yeah? Right. So it's not like eight quizzes where it's like three questions? No. No, no, no. What it'll be is that the, <laughs> there'll be a tower with 28 different slots. Your 28 choices. And if you're going to select eight. And they'll be clearly, clearly labeled. Like maybe, maybe you specifically want to redo quiz seven, question one. You'd go up there and select it. It's a single sheet of paper. Can 
I'd, I'd rather you not do that because then there's too much paper floating around. But you can, you can, you can get, get the eight that you want, and then you might say, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm not even going to try this one. You can, you, can, you can discard that one that you don't want to meet and go select a different one. I just don't want mounds and mounds of paper everywhere. Other questions? Okay, exciting times. So let's get to um, new things. So we're in section 10.4 for a little bit. which is called applications, applications of differential equations. Okay. So we're going to do a couple of examples, but here's the main purpose that I want you to take from this section. Uh, up to now, Whenever I've given you a differential equations exercise, I have more or less just handed you the differential equation and said, here it is. Now solve it. And I haven't really given you any clear reason why the differential equation is the way it is. Why should it be this way? I've just been avoiding that by just giving you the diff differential equation and saying, okay, now compute. The purpose of this section is I want you to be able to look at a differential equation or look at a, look at a, a word problem or a situation and say and be able to have some idea why should the differential equation look like that and not something else. So the purpose of this section is so you can get some idea why does the differential equation look like that. All right. Let's have an example. Suppose that we have a bank account balance and that we're denoting this bank account balance as B and that we have a continuously compounding interest rate R and we have an initial balance B0 okay so what I want is I want a differential equation to model this. Okay. So I'm going to start you out. We're going to say that it's got to look like this. dB dt is equal to blank. So first off, <clears throat> what does B represent? It says it right there. <laughs> it's the balance of the account. So if B is the balance of the account, then what does dB dt represent? Mm -hmm. This is the rate at which B changes 
over time. Okay. So in particular, when dB dt is positive, what does that mean about the balance? It means that the balance is increasing. And when dB dt is negative, that means that the balance is decreasing. So you could imagine, um, you know, tr try, try to get away from a, a real situation where you actually are making discrete deposits and withdrawals. Let's imagine some enormous corporation like Walmart who's probably making deposits and withdrawals all the time. So that would mean that at a time when Walmart is walking over their cash registers full of cash over to Bank of America or wherever they go, okay, at that time, dB dt for them is positive because they're making deposits. Whereas in the middle of the night when Walmart is still operating, Still, still trucking all kinds of stuff all over the road, unpacking stuff, putting it on the shelves, cleaning the store. They're still operating. But during those times, I'm sure that Walmart is losing money, like, say, at 2 in the morning. Then it, in, in that case, dBDT is negative, okay, because they're losing money during that time. Okay. What kind of stuff needs to go in the box? Well, it has to be things which affect the balance. Well, what does affect the balance? In this story, there's only, besides the initial deposit, which presumably you make, the initial balance, you, you have no influence. What's the only influence over the account balance? The interest rate, right? That's the only kind of thing that goes in the box. So, so interest rate stuff goes in there. Somehow interest rate stuff has to go in there. Okay. Now what specifically should go in there? What should go in there? Well, this is where you have to remember kind of how, how interest works. So let's think about it. Suppose that um, two people both open accounts at a bank, and the terms offered to each person are the same. The, this person gets the same terms as that person. So in particular, they both have the same interest rate. Suppose that the first person makes a thousand dollar initial deposit and the other one makes uh, a ten thousand dollar initial deposit. So that one of them has a thousand dollar balance and the other a ten thousand dollar balance. And suppose that neither one of them makes any further modifications to the account. They'll both get an interest payment. Who gets the bigger interest payment? Yeah, the one with the bigger balance. Right? They're both going to get an interest payment, but the one with the 10000 is going to get a bigger interest payment. Well, how is that fair? Why is that fair? Or maybe, maybe fair is not a good word. <laughs> Why is that the way that it is? Yeah. For example, if the interest rate was 
2% of 10,000 is just more than 2% of 1,000. It just is. So the interest payment is proportional, is proportional in proportion to the current account balance. You know, it's fun to try to imagine, you know, you, you imagine like the wealthiest person in the world, which is who, by the way, now? It just changed just a couple days ago. The Amazon guy, Bezos, right? I don't know, I don't know what his net worth is. It's something like a lot, right? <laughs> Let's just say 100 billion. It's, it, I think it's a little less, actually, but 100 billion. It's fun to imagine, like what's 2% of 100 billion? <laughs> I don't know, I think it's probably more than I make in a year though. <laughs> Can you imagine, <laughs> right, if I had 100 billion? I wouldn't have to do anything, and I'd literally make more than I do now. <laughs> Sorry? Ah, oh, well, you know, that's kind of philosophical. You know, you take someone like Bill Gates, who was formerly the world's richest person. He spends all of his time, at this point, trying to cure malaria. So, you know, he doesn't seem to be... Bill, Bill Gates in particular doesn't seem to be trying to make money hand over fist much, too much anymore. But his, his Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation do invest pretty aggressively. <laughs> At any rate, yeah, it does raise the question, how much is enough? I think 100 billion is probably coming to enough. <laughs> Whatever. So, so the rate of change of the balance is going to be in proportion to the current balance. So what what goes in the box? What do I need to write? Not quite. So let me Let's write down it in words. The, the, the time rate of change of the balance needs to be proportional to the current balance. That's what that means, is to say, well... If you've got a big balance, then your interest payments will be big. And if you've got a small balance, then your interest payments will be small. The interest payment is going to be, and therefore the, the time rate of change, is going to be proportional to the current balance. So dBdt is what? What will be the formula? Well, what is the current balance? It's b, right? And then what is the proportionality constant? It's going to be R. This right here, this is the, this is the fundamental equation for compounding money, or for that matter, anything. So, you know, ignoring all this other stuff, we're saying money, okay? But if B represents a population, and if the population grows uh, at a rate of 3%, then it would be DP DT is 0.03P, okay? And, and at that point, we might be talking about, say, human beings, okay? Or bacteria, or anything else that grows proportionally. Okay, so we could solve this equation. How could we solve this? But I guess before we solve it, is it clear why it's got to be this way? This is saying that the interest payment is proportional to the current balance. Big balances mean big interest payments. Small balances mean small interest payments. 
So we can solve this with what? How can we solve it? With separation? Yeah, we could do it with separation. of variables. So after you separate the variables, moving the b to the left-hand side, 1 over b db is r dt. So I move the dt to the other side and the b to the left-hand side. But besides separation, what could we do? It's that other thing. And do you remember we've had a weekend <laughs> in between then and now? Okay. Or we could use an integrating factor. Gray ting. Okay, do you remember the integrating factor thing? So we'd have to get this in standard form, db dt, uh, and then plus p of t, b is q of t. So do you remember doing that? And then what's the formula for the integrating factor? Once, once you get it here, then what's the formula? been a while since we thought about this, I see. So the exponential <laughs> of the antiderivative of p of t dt. Okay, then you continue, etc. Either way, once you do this, you obtain the formula that the balance is the initial balance times the exponential of RT. Okay, that's the formula when, you, when you've solved the differential equation. Now, what I want you to recall from college algebra and even the beginning of this course, because I reviewed it for you at the beginning of this course, you have this formula. A is P times the exponential of RT. Do you observe that, of course, these two formulas are exactly the same formula? They're exactly the same. This is called the principle, which is to say the balance at the beginning. Here we just happen to be call we happen to be calling it b zero. This is the balance at any time, and so is this. They're the same formula. Interesting. So now you have a real strong justification for why this formula that you learned from college algebra really is a legitimate formula, because it is a consequence, for example, of this differential equation. Okay. <clears throat> now, I want you to verify that B equal to B zero exponential RT satisfies the differential equation. db dt is rb. So what does it mean to do this? So I gave you an exercise, a written homework exercise that is like this. And it's due on Thursday. So what is it, what do you need to do to carry out this request.
Well, let's look. We could take this equation and we could differentiate both sides with respect to t. So we took this equation and now we're differentiating both sides. So what's the short, short way to write d dt b? Well, that's the time derivative of b, right? So the, sh the shorthand way to write that is db dt. So these two are the same. And now we want to differentiate this with respect to t. So how about b0? What is that? So what important property does b0 have when you're trying to compute derivatives? It's a constant, right? It's the value, it, it was, it was the, the, the initial value of the account. So the, it commutes past the derivative. Okay. So what's the exponential uh, what's the derivative of the exponential of RT? So how about this? What's, what is the derivative of just the exponential by itself? Say DDT of E to T. E to t. So whenever you differentiate an exponential, you always get exactly that exponential back. So we'll get exactly exponential rt back. That's, that's one of the reasons why exponential is so important. But in addition to that, you'll also get the derivative of rt. And why does this, why does this extra bit show up? What causes it to show up? The chain rule. Okay, and then what is DDT of RT? It's just R. It would be like me asking, what, what is the derivative of 5t? It's 5, because 5 is a constant. What's the derivative of 9t? Well, that's 9, because 9 is a constant. And the derivative of rt is r, because r is constant. OK, now. I'm going to move that r to the front. They're, <laughs> they're doing dental work over there if, if, you, <laughs> if you have any cavities. So I just moved the r to the front. And what I want you to look at is that don't we have another name? Don't we have another name for this? b0 e to rt? It's B, isn't it? Interesting. So this solution, th this equation, really does satisfy the differential equation. Interesting. Any question about 
this. Okay, now, this differential equation right here, what it represents is it's conceptually like, okay, we've got a bank account with an interest rate, and then I just drop some money into it, and then make no further interaction with the bank account except just to watch what happens. That's what this represents. Of course, that's not the way people use bank accounts. Okay, the way people use bank accounts is that when you open one, you make an initial deposit, and then you're making deposits all the time and withdrawals, your money's going in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. So in that sense, this particular equation is not particularly um, accurate reflection of the way we really use bank accounts. So now let's, let's fix that. Suppose we have a bank account. Balance. B that we have continuously compounding interest rate R that we have initial balance B0, and that we have uh, continuous uh, deposit rate, deposit F of T. So now we have this F of T, and what F of T conceptually represents, this represents when f of t is positive, that means you're making deposits. And when f of t is negative, that means you're making withdrawals. So f of t represents th this, this new bit makes uh, the, the situation more reflective of reality. So again, the structure of it's got to look like this. DBDT is a box. The stuff that affects the balance, all the things that affect the balance have to go in the box. So let's think about a bank account. There's, there's two parties that affect the balance in a bank account. And one of them is the bank. Because they've entered into an agreement with you, a contractual agreement for these interest payments. Okay, so then they so the bank itself affects your bank account balance. But who else does too? You do, right? Because you can be putting money in and taking money out. Okay, so there's two parties, there's two actors involved. <coughs> So on the one hand, what needs to go in here is the bank's proportional uh, rate stuff. But what else needs to go in there is also your deposits. So as a result, what is going to be the differential equation? What, what is the bank's portion of the differential equation of these terms? 
So what will be the consequence of the bank? Hmm? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. R. Not almost, R what? So it'll be RB, right? It's RB because because what the banks what the bank does is in proportion to your bank account to your current balance. If you have a big balance, they're make, gonna make a big interest payment. If you have a small balance, they're gonna make a small interest payment. Okay? And then what's your uh, result? Well, it's just going to be plus f of t. So it's, it's interesting that with just this slight modification, this now represents the way bank accounts work. This is what the bank does. This is what you do. So now we could, uh, we could solve this. So let's solve one of these. Let's solve a specific one of these. So solve when uh, B0 is 1326. Seven percent and F of T is say a thousand. So to interpret to interpret f of t being a thousand, what that means is that you're always making deposits, and over the course of a year, you will have deposited exactly um, one thousand dollars. So over the course of ten years, you will have deposited exactly ten thousand dollars. But the one thing that's kind of weird about this, in the sense that it's not realistic, is that this is a continuous deposit. So like at every moment you're depositing fractions of pennies and things like that. Okay. So what's the differential equation when, when these three things are, are given? So dB dt is what? So is it too subtle or is it too obvious? Point oh seven B and then what? Plus a thousand. So here's the differential equation. And we want to solve for B. So how can we solve it? Separate variables, okay? Uh, and beside, and if you didn't want to do that, you could also use an integrating factor for this one. So uh, let's see. If we separate variables, that means that we could write it like this: one over zero point zero seven b plus a thousand. db is dt. So I put the dt on the other side and all of this stuff on the left hand side. Okay, so then antiderivative of both sides.
Okay, so hopefully you've done enough of these to where you can uh, do it directly. So this would be, uh, watch, 1 over 0 0.07 natural log of the absolute value of 0.07b plus 1,000. So that's the right-hand side. And then what is the uh, antiderivative of the right-hand side? T plus a constant. Okay, so there's the antiderivative. So now we want to solve for B. B is currently inside of the argument to log. Okay. The, one of the most pressing issues is this absolute value. So what about that absolute value? Why is this thing positive? Because B is always going to be positive, right? It's always going to be positive because, you, because of just purely mechanical considerations. Imagine that you make a deposit of $1,326 into a bank account that has an interest rate and then you do nothing else with it except add more money. When is it going to be, when is the bank account balance going to be negative? <laughs> right, but, but because of the, because of what we've said, that, that never occurs. We're not making, we're not ever making any withdrawals. So that means that the, the bank account balance is positive initially and positive forever. So as a result of those considerations, we can drop the absolute value. Now what? Good. So natural log Okay, now what? Right, so then to get, the, to get the logarithm to move to the other side, on the left-hand side, it's logarithm, but moving it to the right-hand side, it's exponential. So it would be 0.07b plus 1,000 is the exponential of 0.07t plus... 0.07c. Okay, then I could move the thousand over and divide by 0 0.07. So doing that, wrapping up those algebraic operations, that would be what? B is equal to exponential 0.07t and then I'll separate that and say times exponential 0.07c um, minus 1,000 divide by 0 0.07. Okay, good. So have we... Um, That's weird. Is that right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so now what do we need to do? Or alternatively, what have we not done? So 
So what have we not done? Or alternatively, what information have we not used? Yeah, we haven't used the initial deposit. So what is it that we can figure out from the initial deposit? Mm -hmm. Right. When T is 0, B is 1326. And that will let us figure out what this is. Right. So really, it's not really that we want C, it's that we want this whole thing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rename that as just a, just a K or something. So exponential of 0 0.07T, and then multiplied by K, we want to figure out what K is, minus 1,000 over 0 0.07. That is writing... K is exponential of 0.07C. So to determine K, we'll use that TB equal to 0, 1326 is a solution. Okay. So 1326 is, well, if you plug in t is 0, that's the exponential of 0. What's the exponential of 0? It's 1. So this would be k minus 1,000. divide by 0 0.07. Then we can solve for k. So, uh, what is that? So, 1326 uh, times 0 0.07 is k minus 1,000. So, k is 1326 times 0 0.07 plus 1,000. So K is 1092.82. Therefore, we've now determined that the bank account balance is given by exponential of 0 0.07 T multiplied by 1092.82 minus a thousand over zero point zero seven. Interesting. So that's the bank account balance at any time. Notice, notice that this formula is is more complicated looking. than the other one, than the PERT formula. Why is it that the PERT formula is, sim is simpler? <clears throat> in the end, that's it. Is that in the PERT formula, who's the only party? Who's the only actor? 
the bank. When you start, when you start adding in your actions, okay, which could be all over the place, right? Adding money, taking money out, <coughs> then the formula starts to become more entertaining. Okay, and then <laughs> what's really interesting is that when you've got a lot of <laughs> a lot of terms all floating around. So in our class, in our class, um, the f of t has has to be kind of simple, because in the end you have to be able to integrate something. You have to be, you're going to have to be able to integrate it. And if it's too complicated, then you can't integrate it. So in our class, f of t basically is going to end up always being a constant or an exponential or a constant times t. And then almost, almost anything else is starting to become too complicated or impossible to deal with in a short amount of time using what you know. So this, uh, this f in general, when you're dealing with differential equations, is called the forcing term. It's called the forcing term because uh, when you're designing something, it's the thing that you have control over. So you don't really have control over what the bank does, but you do have control over how much money you put in and take out of your bank account. So that's your, that's your force, your, le your lever on the system. Similarly, uh, for a different example for things that grow proportionally would be things like, say, organisms. So this could be this exact same differential equation also uh, models the size of a population of a group of organisms like bacteria. This is how the bacteria grow when left to themselves. Okay? The, the, the rate at which they grow is proportional to their current size. Okay, assuming that they haven't run out of, <laughs> of resources. This would be like how you can experimentally control that size. So you can't sit the bacteria down and have a conversation with them or anything, but you could limit their size by, say, limiting their food or adding in various things that make them grow faster or more slowly. Okay, so that's the, that's the control, the forcing term. Okay, <clears throat> so let's have another one. What's this? Okay. So this kind, this next thing is always pretty fun. These are called mixing problems. Okay. So before we get to it, I want you to imagine the following sort of scenario. Imagine that uh, we've got a bathtub and it's, you know, about halfway full of water and then someone comes by with a bunch of food coloring, say blue food coloring, they drop, drop, drop a whole bunch of blue food coloring in and give it a, give it a, a a stir. Okay, now all the all the water is blue. Okay, and then imagine that. I hope you've been in chemistry and seen one of those auto stirrers. Have you seen one? They're totally cool, right? You you take a beaker full of liquid stuff, and then you put a magnet inside of it, and then underneath underneath you set it on a plate that has a spinner and it's automatically mm -hmm. stirring. It's it's excellent. So we've got an automatic stirrer in there, keeping it all really mixed up. Blue water. Now I want you to imagine that we, we start the clock, and at the same time that we start the clock, we turn on the tap, which is pouring out clear water, and we open up the drain. But the, but the amount of water coming in is the same as the amount of water going out, so that the water level is not actually going up or down, and we're keeping it mixed. Okay, so it's kind of, there's a lot of moving parts. Okay, so we've got a bathtub, it's halfway full, we make, we make it blue, it's being stirred up, we turn on the tap, clear water, and open up the drain, and the mixture water pours out. My question to you is, 
What will happen to the color of water as time progresses? It's going to get lighter and lighter and lighter until eventually it's so light that you can't tell that it was ever blue. Okay, similarly, what if, what if we started out with what if we started out with blue water, same as before, but now we play a, a prank and instead of clear tap water coming out, now green water comes out of the tap. But otherwise the system is the same. Green water's coming in, it's all being mixed up, and then the mixture water is pouring out. What's going to happen to the water eventually? It's going to turn green. Is it the, blue, the blueness, is it going to eventually be diluted and poured down the drain? So, so understand that whatever is coming out of the tap, that's the force that you have. That's the control, the lever that you have on the system. If you could arrange matters so that red water came out of the tap, eventually the system would be red. If you could arrange matters so that purple water came out, it would eventually be purple. Okay, but understand that color is just a stand-in for anything. Okay, we could be talking about temperature. I could say, imagine that the water in the, in the bathtub is currently uh, 10 degrees Celsius, but that the water coming out of the tap is 30 degrees Celsius, and that it's being all mixed up, and then we run the system like this. What will be the eventual temperature of the water? 30 degrees Celsius. Okay, so then we're about to do a problem. We're about to do a problem, and now the, 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 the metric in question is not going to be color or temperature. It's going to be how much salt is in the water. Okay, so in the end, we're going to be wondering how much salt is there? And why should there be this much salt? Why should it be this way? Okay. So, uh, suppose a tank, contains 100 gallons of salt water mixture. that was made from 10 pounds of salt. Suppose further, at, at time zero, Pure water is poured in at five gallons per minute is mixed. And mixture water is poured out at four gallons per minute. Okay, I want you to determine. amount of salt in the tank at any time. I guess at all time, I mean. So in the first place, notice that um, water is coming in and also water is going out. 
But to make it slightly more interesting, a little bit more water is coming in than going out. So five gallons per minute are coming in, and four gallons per minute are going out. So that means that, you know, I, get, I suppose eventually it's just got to overflow eventually because we're getting more coming in than going out. Okay, fine. So to make sure you understand uh, the scenario, it is like we've got a tank. And there's a tap going in here. When the, when the experiment begins, we've got 100 gallons of water. There's a little stirring thingy in here that's spinning around. <coughs> causing the water to be mixed. Then there's all this salt mixed up in the tank, 10 pounds of it when it begins, and then the salt mixture is pouring out. Wow, I'm having real trouble with these pins right now. And pure water with no salt is coming in. Does everybody understand the apparatus? The question is, is how much salt is there in the system at any time? So in the first place, you should be able to tell me right now, supposing that this is, a, that this is an arbitrarily large tank, how much salt will be in the tank when we run the experiment for a very long time? Zero going to be zero. There's going to be a whole lot of water because <laughs> it's slowly filling up. But there's going to be zero because you're filling it up with, with pure water and letting the mixture water pour out. Okay. So what do you want to call... So this is, uh, this is what we're going to name things our symbols. What do you want to call the amount of salt? So we need a we need a letter for it. K S okay S. So the amount of salt is S. So I'll leave I'll leave myself some room to write more stuff there as it comes up. What we want is we want a differential equation which models the amount of salt. So specifically, we're going to have ds dt is equal to something. So now, in this question, the way this question is phrased, the force, the forcing thing, that is to say the input, this has no salt in it. But in principle, I could, I could modify this problem and say, suppose that this mildly salty water is being poured in, whatever. So in that case, there's only two places that affect the amount of salt, okay, the inputs and the outputs. So this would be, generally speaking, this is the rate of the salt in minus the rate of the salt out. <coughs> so now, in this particular problem, how much salt is coming in? None. None. So on this particular problem, there's no salt coming in. But in general, 
it could be could be more could be different Okay, so we just have minus the rate of the salt going out. So now let's think, how much salt is going out? Here's where you've got to think, and, and you can get stuck a little bit. How much salt is leaving? Well, it's not told, they don't tell us in the story. Exactly. What they are telling us is how much, how much of the fluid is leaving. How much of the fluid is leaving? Yeah, four gallons per minute. So that's how much of the fluid is leaving. And if it was a really salty mixture, that means that a lot of salt would be leaving. And if it was a barely salty mixture, that means just a little bit of salt would be leaving, right? If there's no salt in it, then no salt would be leaving. Okay. <clears throat> so now we need to think about, think about this. What if, what if before we start the pumps, Okay, so that there's no inputs and no outputs, and we just have that initial condition right there when we have 10 pounds of salt mixed into, into a 100-gallon solution. And what if, what if we remove um, 10, 10 gallons? Then how much salt do we remove? One pound. One pound as, it, as it sits initially. And if we removed all 100 gallons, we would have removed all 10 pounds. So the amount of salt that leaves in four gallons really depends on the concentration of the salt in the mixture, right? If the concentration is high, then a lot of salt leaves. If the concentration is low, then a little bit of salt leaves. So really this should be just this this term. This should be the rate uh, of volume going out. And then multiplied by the concentration. the salt in the volume. Well, what's the rate of the volume going out? It's just four. And then now, what's the concentration of the salt in the volume? Sorry? I, I couldn't hear you because they're doing it. It's 10% at the very beginning. I agree with that. Uh, you, could, you could write it as 10 over 100 at the very beginning. But that's only at the beginning because once you start the machine, then salt, the salt is pouring out. So generally, the concentration is going to be whatever S currently is divided by whatever V currently is. And those are both changing in time, right? The amount of salt changes in time, the amount of volume changes in time, and therefore the concentration changes in time. So now let's consider, let's consider this differential equation. How many, how many variables are in it? There's three variables in it that change in time.
there's S, there's T, and there's also V. In order for us to proceed, we need just two of them. We need just S and T. So we need to eliminate V because we want just S and T. Because once we get to an, a differential equation that involves only S and T, then we'll be able to use our standard techniques and we'll be able to solve for S. Okay. So that means that because we want to eliminate V, now we need to figure out what V is. Well, it also satisfies its own differential equation. DVD, DV dt, well, that's the rate of volume coming in minus the rate of the volume going out. Well, how much volume is coming in? Five. And how much volume is going out? Four. So dv dt. So over here where we're, I, since I had to introduce a new symbol, volume is v. dv dt is 5 minus 4, which is to say that dv dt is 1. Okay, now we'd like to solve this differential equation. So how can we solve this one? Yeah, by separation, right? Or, once you're comfortable enough with this, you can probably just tell me the answer. Yeah, V is T plus some unknown constant. But I'll do it by separation. DV is DT. And I differentiate both sides. So that V is T plus some unknown, which I'll call V0. How do we figure out V0? I'm sorry? What should V0 represent? How, how what will inform us about V0. Well, we're, that's what we're trying to find eventually. Here, <laughs> I'll give you, <laughs> I think me writing it as V0 might have thrown you off. Let me just call it C. How do we figure out C? Not yet. We, we still need to figure out V. Right? We can't come back to here until we're finished with V. Right. So we'll determine C so just copying that equation V is T plus C. So to determine C, we'll use that at a certain time the volume is known to be what? So at what certain time is the volume known to be a certain value? At time zero, the volume is known to be 100. Okay, so then uh, 100 is 0 plus C, so C is 100. So as a result now, we've solved for V. Uh, so V is T plus 100. Okay. So now we're going to put that into uh, that place where we stopped, DS, DT. 
is negative 4 s over v. So now I'm going to take this. Put it in there. To obtain that ds dt is negative 4 s over t plus 100. Okay. Now this equation right here, how many variables does it have? Just two, right? Just s and t. Whereas before, this one had three. It had s and t, but it also had v. So we did all this volume work to eliminate v. Yeah, the variable v. So now let's, um, let's solve this equation. So how do you want to solve it? really only two techniques that we have. We have separation and integrating factor. You do the integrating factor? I don't really care. <laughs> okay, so if we're going to use uh, an integrating factor, so we want to solve this. If we're going to use an integrating factor, that means we need to get it into the form ds dt plus p of t s is q of t. So what can we do to get this equation into that form? We could move that term to the other side. So ds dt and then plus 4 over t plus 100 s is equal to 0. So is everybody okay getting it to here? So what is P of T then? Well, it's, it's that term, right? Just matching things up. So now, comparing, comparing methods, the separation versus integrating factor, integrating factor is very often less algebraic work. Like there's just less little algebraic steps you have to do. So, so that's nice. But that is in exchange for memorizing the formula. So, in the first place, we need to know what, what is the formula for the integrating factor i of t. So can you remember the, the formula? I think I wrote it a few pages ago. I'm kind of getting familiarity here. It's the exponential of the antiderivative of p dt. So, that would be the exponential of the antiderivative of 4 over t plus 100 dt. 
And what's the what is the antiderivative of four over t plus a hundred? Very good. So this would be exponential and then four natural log absolute value t plus a hundred. Okay, now let's think about that absolute value for a moment. Can we be rid of it? Why can we be rid of it? Right. It's never negative, right? Because we're starting the experiment at time zero, and this this machine has no memory of what happened before that. Nothing nothing before that is relevant. So This would be exponential of 4 natural log t plus 100. Okay, now what? So how can this be simplified? It can be simplified. So I'm just copying that thing so that I have it up here. Exponential, uh, I think I pressed a button or something, uh, for natural log t plus 100. How can this be simplified? I'm sorry? I don't know what you mean divide by 4. Okay. So, what what needs to happen is that this will be natural log of t plus 100 and this 4 can come inside of the argument to the natural log like this as an exponent. So what I used here on this step is that a times the natural log of b is the natural log of b with exponent a. So that a exponent can move out to the front or in, in and out. So this 4 moved inside and became the exponent of t plus 100. Okay, now that we've done that, now what? Right. The, the exponential and the logarithm are inverse functions, so they cancel. So you're left with t plus 100 to power 4, because exponential and logarithm are inverse functions. Okay, so we figured out what i of t is. Now what? What do you do with the integrating factor? Can you remember what it is that you do with it? <laughs> now that we worked so hard to find it. <laughs> right. You take the equation, this equation, and you multiply both sides of this equation by i of t. So now, 
uh, t plus 100 to power 4 multiplied by ds dt plus 4 over t plus 100 s is 0 multiplied by t plus 100 to power 4. Well, the right-hand side is pretty easy. What's the right-hand side? 0. <laughs> and then now for the left-hand side, what's best is for you to remember what the underlying trick, <coughs> what the underlying trick and technique is being used for uh, the integrating factor. <coughs> The integrating factor is, this simplifies through a clever use of the product rule into the derivative of t plus 100 to power 4 times s. That's, that's something that you have to memorize. It's always, this thing is always derivative of i of t times s. So now, instead of trying to separate the variables, what, into, what the integrating factor does is it separates the differentials. So now I can move this dt to the other side so that we obtain the differential <coughs> of t plus 100 to 4 s is 0 dt. So moving that dt to the other side. So now that we've separated the differentials, what can we do? <clears throat> Anti-differentiate. So anti-differentiating the left-hand side is straightforward. So t plus 100 to 4 s is the antiderivative of 0 dt. And what's the antiderivative of 0 dt? Sure. Nearly. Plus, plus a constant, right? Except we already use C, so I'll write K. So how do we figure out what K is? So to, deter to determine k, what? I'm sorry? Yes. We'll use that t, that t and s are known at a specific value of t and s. So what specific value of t and s? 0 and 10. Because at time zero, how much salt was there? 10 pounds. OK. Um, OK, I guess I should have solved for s first, but it doesn't matter. OK, so we plug in t is 0. We get 100 to 4. Oops, yeah, well, OK. 100 to 4 times 10 is equal to k. Well, that's 10 to 2. 10 to 2 to 4 is 10 to 8 times another 10 is 10 to 9. So 10 to 9 is k. So as a result, we know 
we know that t plus 100 to exponent 4 s is 10 to 9. So now we've solved for s. s is 10 to 9 divided by t plus 100 to 4. Interesting. So that means that I could ask, uh, for example, <coughs> I could say, how much salt is there um, at 10 minutes? No, let's not use 10 minutes because we're already using 10 pounds. Let's do 20 minutes. <sighs> so in the end, what am I asking you to do? Yeah, plug in a number. So you get S is uh, 10 to 9 divided by 120 to 4. I'm just going to I'm going to make it I'm going to use a decimal. <laughs> That's, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that number you just quoted. Okay, there we go. So 4.8, and I would, I would ask you to give it to three places past the decimal or something like that. So 4.823, what is the meaning of that number? Yeah, there's 4.8 pounds of salt left after 20 minutes. Okay, after an hour there'd be there'd be even less. So <clears throat> what happens to the amount of salt in the tank? when the machine runs for a very long time. So what am I asking you to do here? To compute a limit. So I want you to compute the limit as time goes to infinity of the amount of salt. Well, in the first place, you ought to be able to tell me the answer to the question without performing a computation at all. So what, what should the answer be and, and why? Zero. Should be zero. Why should it be zero? Yeah, because because we've got this salt container thingy and we keep pouring pure water into it and mixing it all up and letting the mixture flow out. Well, there's going to be no salt. So this would be the limit as t goes to infinity of that expression 10 to 9 divided by t plus 100 to 4. Well, 10 to 9, that's a big number. But it's a constant. And as t goes to infinity, t plus 100 is going to infinity. And then you raise it to exponent 4, and it's going to infinity at an even higher rate. And then we're dividing a billion by this number that's going to infinity. So what's the limit? It's zero. Okay, so then uh, 
you know, not, not to harp on this point too much, but uh, an, an example, a, a different example of this is that um, not, not to be gross, but like when someone has abdominal surgery, like when they have to have laparoscopic surgery inside of their, their abdomen, when they ha and the, the, the doctor has to, you should watch it on YouTube, it's incredible. Really, it's incredible. Unless you have a weak stomach, then don't do it. <laughs> when, when the doctor needs to clear out, you know, debris or whatever, they just keep pumping in saline and then pu pouring it back out, pumping it in, pouring it out, in, out, in, out, in, out. Because there's a whole, there's a saying in, in, among surgeons and among all kinds of people who have to clean up messes, the solution to pollution is dilution, right? So how much salt will there be? None, right? You keep pouring in clean water and, and pouring out the mixture. Of course, after a long enough time, it's going to be clean. Good. Any questions about differential equations before we move to a completely different topic? Any questions? Differential equations are <coughs> one of the one of the very powerful tools that human beings have been fortunate enough to discover in our endeavors. Okay. So now we're in section 12.1. Uh, and it is called geometric sequences. So in the first place, we need to define what a sequence is. So a sequence is a function with signature n to r. So what I think we all know what the R means. What does the R mean? Yeah, reals. But you may be less confident about what the N means. What does the N mean? The naturals. So in this book, anyway, the, the natural numbers are the positive integers. So one, two, three, four, etc. In other contexts, the natural numbers include zero. But for our purposes, the natural numbers start with one. OK. So let's have an example. Now, one, one thing about sequences is that uh, when you write a calculus function, like a function that we're going to, from, with signature reals to reals, that we're going to do calculus on, you typically write f of x, blah, 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 in the usual way. But when you're dealing with sequences, the argument is written as a subscript. So I'll show you what I mean. So a, and then its argument is named n, will say is equal to, hmm, how about n over 2n plus 1. So the argument, the input, is called n, and it's written as a subscript. So I could ask for you to please tell me, what is a 1? I'm sorry? Barbecue sauce. Barbecue sauce? Yeah, very good. <laughs> so what is a 1? <laughs> It'd be 1 over 3. OK, A2. Two. 2 
2 over 5. How about uh, a mm, 20? 20 over 41. So is there any question about these sequences? So they're just like functions that you've, ever, that you've always ever dealt with. Uh, except the argument is written as a subscript and in at least one sense they're a little bit simpler than functions because uh, the left hand side of the signature is naturals instead of reals so it would be absolutely forbidden for me to ask you about a one half why Half's not a natural number. Doesn't make any sense to ask about to about to ask about inputs to the sequence that aren't natural. Okay. So now there's a wide and beautiful uh, story about sequences, but we're going to now narrow our discussion to a specific kind of sequence. So a geometric sequence is a sequence such that The first requirement is that a1 is some constant value a with a not 0. So the f that is to say that the first term in the sequence is something that's not 0. It could be positive, it could be negative, it just can't be 0. And 2 a n plus 1 is r multiplied by a n with r not equal to 0. So let me explain what this means. This means that if you know r and you know one term of the sequence, you can get the next one by multiplying by r. So for example, if you knew the eighth one, the eighth term, you can figure out the ninth term by multiplying by r. If you knew the if you knew the fortieth term, you could figure out the forty-first term by multiplying by r. But do understand that once you know any term, you can find all subsequent terms by repeatedly multiplying by r. So if I gave you the fifth term and I wanted you to find the ninth one, then you can multiply by r by r by r by r by that, that'd be enough, and that would get you to the ninth one. Okay. <clears throat> so, I have a question for you. Why should I require that A is not zero? That the first term is not zero? Because that would mean if the first term is zero, then what's the next term? Also zero, <laughs> because, because you'd have to multiply the first term by something to get the next term, and then it would be zero. And if the second one is zero, then so is the third one, and the fourth one, and all of them. So that's, that's a profoundly uninteresting circumstance. So we're not talking about that. Uh, why will I require that, that r is not zero? <laughs> for the same reasons, right? If the first term was 12 and r is 0, what's the next term? 0. <laughs> and then the next one? 0. Okay, that's really not interesting. So what a and r being not 0 mean, they just means that we're not talking about this case where, where all of the terms are 0, or nearly all of them. So because of these, so as a result, 
of these two rules? Well, A1 is A. That's just copying the first rule. Then what's A2? Yeah, except I agree entirely with what you said, except I'm going to write AR for a reason that will be clear in a moment. Uh, then what's A3? It would be it would be A R and then R again, right? It would be it would be this one times R. Which is to say it's A R squared. Okay, what's A four? A R cubed. Not to belabor the point too much, but what would be, uh, how about A9? A R to exponent 8. Okay, then generally, what is the formula for A N? Mm -hmm. It's A. R, and then the exponent is always one less. So the exponent is n minus one. Okay, any question about uh, this? So here's a, this is a formula that you must be familiar with from now on. All geometric sequences can be written in that fashion. However, uh, it's these two rules that are really required to have an intuition about the way geometric sequences work. A geometric sequence is a sequence that starts out with some non-zero number and then all subsequent numbers are obtained by repeated multiplications by R. Okay, for that reason, I could say, well, suppose that the first few terms first few terms of a geometric sequence are given as 6 24 uh, 96, 384. So I give you the first few terms there. My request for you is to find A, R, and also A7. So A is pretty straightforward. What's A? It's 6, right? It's the first one. R requires a little bit of work. What is R? It's 4. So let's think about it for a moment. Remember intuitively, conceptually, what R is, it tells you how to get to the next term. So from 6 to get to the next one, you multiply by R to get 24. So you had to multiply by something to get to 24. What did you have to multiply 6 by to get 24? Well, 4. So it should be 
24 divided by 6. But besides 24 divided by 6, what else must it also be? It must also be 4. It must also be 96 over 24. Right? What else must it be? Three eighty four over ninety six. That is to say, it is the ratio of any two successive terms. So if you if you work all of these with your calculator, every one of those is four. So as a result of that, you should be able to tell me A seven. So what's A seven? Well, it would be 6 multiplied by 4 to what exponent? 6, because that's 7 minus 1. And then that's something that you could just type into your calculator. 6 times 4 to 6. Oops. I'm getting 24,576. Any question about this? So in principle, I could ask you to find any, any of them. I could say, well, what about A20? And then you could just do 6 times 4 to 19. Okay, any question about this? So because of the way geometric sequences are, they really can't get much more complicated. The questions that I can ask about them can't get much more complicated than this. Okay. So now we're going to talk about something that's not a geometric sequence, but a geometric sequence is involved. Now we're going to talk about a geometric sum. So now here's a warning, and that is that um, it is unfortunate, in my opinion, that sum and sequence both start with letter S. If I could somehow go back in time and encourage folks to choose different names, I would. Because many students at this position in the course get confused between the distinction, get confused about the distinction between a geometric sequence and a geometric sum. And then it gets even worse when you start talking about another thing called a series, which also starts with S. Then everything's all completely mixed up. So just be warned. So given uh, geometric sequence a n is a multiplied by r to n minus 1, let's write out the first several terms. So what's the first term of this sequence? Well, it'd be A, right? What's the next one? A, R. And then A, R squared. And then A, R cubed, etc. So those are all the, the terms in the sequence. I want you to find the sum of the first k terms so we'll denote this in the following way so we'll denote the sum of the first k first k terms with sk and that would be a plus ar plus AR squared, plus dot, 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 plus. And what's the last, uh, the last term that's going to be added? AR to what exponent? Right, K minus 1. 
So that's the last one. Because that's one, two, three k terms. So that's the kth one. So we want to find the sum of all of these. So now I want you to imagine the following extremely tedious exercise. So here on this exercise, we had established that a n could be written as 6 multiplied by 4 to n minus 1, minus 1. So now suppose that I said, OK, I want you to find the sum of the first 10 terms. Then you could, you could do the following. You could, comp you could compute the first 10 terms. There they all are. And then type them all into your calculator and say, OK, I did it. Then I could say, OK, now find the sum of the first 20 terms. And at that point, I'd hope you'd say, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm just not going to. <laughs> I won't do it. So what we want to do is we want to come up with a formula that would let us do even the first 200 terms with relatively small uh, effort, okay, without having to compute every single term uh, and without a bunch of tedious bookkeeping. So here's the trick. I want you to observe the following. What happens if we take SK and we multiply it by R? Then what would be the first term? That is to say, what if I put an R here and then A plus a r plus a r squared plus dot 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 plus. What if we distribute the r in? What will be the first term? A r. And the next one? <laughs> a r squared plus a r cubed plus all the way to a r to k. The last one will be k. That is to say, when you take this thing that we want and you multiply it by r, that's what happens. Therefore, look what happens when you do this. When you do SK minus R multiplied by SK. So that is to say, I'm going to take the red box and I'm going to subtract from it the green box. And I'm going to make the terms line up in a nice way. So um, <clears throat> in red parentheses, that would be a plus ar plus ar squared plus dot, 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 plus ar2 k minus 1. So that's all the red terms. And then from that, we're going to subtract all of the green terms. And the first green term is AR. So AR plus AR squared plus dot, 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 plus a r to k minus 1 plus a r to k. So do you observe that there's a great deal of cancellation that goes on? For example, we're going to add a r and then subtract a r. So these cancel. as do the next pair, as do all of these pairs up to this one. 
So there's a whole bunch of cancellation. Does everything cancel? What doesn't cancel? That A and that AR to K, right? These are the things that remain. So that means that SK minus R SK is A minus A R to K. So now, what um, do you observe that there's something common on the right hand side? What's common? The A is common. So we could factor out A. And if we do that, then what do I have to write in here? Very good. 1 minus R to K. And just like A was common on the right hand side, there's something common on the left hand side. What? SK is common. And if we factor out SK, what remains? 1 minus R. So now we can solve for SK. by dividing by 1 minus r. And this is a formula that you now must memorize, if you didn't know it already. So this is the formula for the sum of the first k terms of a geometric sequence. So. Again, making good on my threat, I could say, well, what if I gave you this sequence and I, add you, I asked you to find the sum of the first 10 terms? Find the sum of the first 10 terms of a n is 6 multiplied by 4 to n minus 1. Well, in the end, what I'm asking of you to do, I'm saying that I want you to use this formula, s k, is A multiplied by 1 minus R to K over 1 minus R with some specific values. What, do I, what is A? It's 6. What is R? 4. And what is K? 10. So this is something that you can do pretty straightforwardly with your calculator. It would be 6 times 1 minus 4 to 10 divided by 1 minus 4. Giving 2 million 97,150. Okay. Isn't that much better than can you imagine having typed out 10 individual terms and then trying to add them all up? Okay. So any question about this one? Okay. So what we're going to do next time is we're going to turn this observation, the sum of the first k terms of a geometric series, into a nice observation about a very common way that money is handled uh, in, in mortgages, in paying off cars, and all kinds of things because recall that car payments, mortgage payments, or whatever, they're a sequence of payments each month. 
and then you know you could imagine putting these into a bank account so once you make the first payment it starts accumulating money and then the next one accumulates money but it starts a little later and the next next one ac accumulates money but a little later and we'll see what that means next time so have a nice tuesday <clears throat>